Of course, radical left ideas have always been with us, but they have for a long time been mostly isolated to socialism. Karl Marx supported the physical removal, so to speak, of feminists like Victoria Woodhull from the First International for trying to pervert the coalition towards identity politics. as well as expelling non-German speaking elements because not German. Therefore, because of a left-wing focus on socialism, it was quite easy for the centre-left to draw a sharp line between itself and the revolutionary socialists who wanted to seize the means of production. Eventually, however, as a lot of battles on union freedom and things like the eight-hour workday began to be won, cultural battles came to the fore. The suffragettes campaigned for the vote concurrent with the general campaign for the vote, but of course giving women the vote meant taking nothing away from anyone else. Fast forwards to the 60s and the civil rights era, and the era of a newly infused feminism in its second wave, and we see the far left change drastically. The new left movement of the late 60s attacked the old conservative Leave It to Beaver society, but also the repressive and dry pro-USSR materialistic far left to focus on social empowerment and more freeform radicalism, autonomous Marxism and, and the like. The kids were making their own revolution. The new left was really a broad movement though. It came out of universities and led to both radical feminism and ideas of black liberation that increased in scope in the 70s and influenced the mainstream civil rights movement resulting in the bleeding of some ideas from outside of liberalism into the mainstream sphere. The Frankfurt School of Thought, which is today often blamed for everything bad under the moniker Cultural Marxism, did have some influence and had existed since the 20s, but saw new life in radical circles in the post-war period, and especially with the rise of the new left. The Frankfurt School idiosyncratically mixed philosophical idealist concepts with Marxist materialism, such as in the fairly oxymoronic Freudo-Marxism. These ideas became popular among the new radical fringe of students who had little connection to working class radicalism because it allowed them to launch a revolution based on the identity issues that actually concerned them and brought critical theory to the fore. The 70s were a time of turmoil in America, but also here in the UK and Europe. Rising racial tensions, the oil crisis and the slow collapse of the economic consensus of the time affected everything. In America particularly, the student movement was infused by the Vietnam War. It was also a time when feminism was experimenting with highly radical ideas. Of the various strands of feminism, radical feminism took women's liberation to the greatest extremes, proposing things such as gender separatism and patriarchy theory. But feminism couldn't stay isolated from other identity issues, and some feminists began to criticise both the radical feminists and the mainstream liberal feminists for solely focusing on women's issues, and they argued that black women were being excluded from what was becoming a white woman's movement. The early strands of intersectionality were forming together. In the 70s, the phrase racism equals prejudice plus power was formulated, though it would take until the 2010s to become a mainstream idea. Racism was beginning to be redefined as being a concept that depends on status. In 1978, Judith H. Katz wrote a book called White Awareness, Handbook for Anti-Racism Training, which made the claim that people of colour cannot be racist against whites because they lack institutional power. After this point, there was a stall in the influence of these radical ideas because of the collapse of the mainstream Anglosphere left, with the 80s being defined by the victories of Reagan and Thatcher. However, behind the scenes, these people were still slowly taking over the universities and making each left-wing generation more and more detached from liberal left ideas, and more and more attached to concepts that were foundationally liberal. Intersectional theory is coined by name in 1989 by critical race theorist Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. This went much further in formulating a theory of intersectional oppression, which would eventually lead to the notion of kiriarchy as a replacement for the singular patriarchy, and the idea of progressive stack, where the disadvantaged are given special rights over privileged classes. At the beginning of the 90s, the conservative backlash petered out, and with the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was in theory a brief moment of goodwill. However, I would venture the theory that the collapse of the Soviet Union meant that within far-left circles, the class essentialists got further discredited, and the supremacy of identity politics began to take hold. The far-left was very angry at being whipped and beaten for a decade by Reagan and Thatcher, but had failed to defeat the changes that were occurring on the economic front. 
Despite an overriding bitterness about Thatcherism in England, the mainstream left in the form of Labour began to moderate their economic demands and try out a strategy of triangulation by moving to the centre on some issues. It was the same story over in America with Bill Clinton. Meanwhile, however, the ideas of political correctness began to have impact in the mainstream. The early to mid-90s were run through by the political correctness wars. I knew that political correctness was a thing by the time I was a teenager, but I did not know the extent and scale of the political correctness war of my childhood, because I wasn't politically aware at the time. Back then, the mainstream left-wing base was in many ways still the liberal left, even if it had been poisoned institutionally by liberal left ideas. So the early wave of political correctness was soundly mocked and ridiculed by comedians and shows like The Simpsons, forcing them to retreat and lick their wounds. It's definitely interesting to go back and watch some of the shows that were satirising political correctness and social justice at the time. The Simpsons episode, Homer Badman, already a hilarious episode, gains a whole new level in light of what is going on today. Uh, I don't know Homer Simpson. Uh, I never met Homer Simpson or had any contact with him, but... <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I can't go on. <laughs> That's okay. Your tears say more than real evidence ever could. The political correctness war was twinned with what became known as the science wars. There was an upsurge in postmodernist deconstructions of the scientific method coming from a critical theory perspective. These concepts had, of course, been developing since the 70s. The philosopher Sandra Harding called Newton's Principia a rape manual in her 1986 book and attacked the focus on rigid mechanics on the ground that this was some kind of patriarchal plot. In 1996, the skirmishes that were going on between different sections of academia exploded into the science wars after a Duke University publication in postmodern critical theory named Social Text published an issue that compiled articles by various theorists emphasising the role of politics in scientific theory. This war, which had been started by the social justice side, continues in some ways to this day, but petered out in its intensity after the postmodern critical theorists received a series of devastating defeats. A particularly notable one from that year is the Sokal Affair, in which a physics professor named Alan Sokal, and with sympathies to the materialist Old Left, posted a fake postmodernist article to the Social Text magazine. This article was extremely well received, and when Sokal revealed that it was a hoax, the intellectual vacuity of postmodern critical theory was exposed for the entire world to see. So we've had this fight before, if on a smaller scale. They came in waves. Even though they were defeated in the daylight, the politically correct brigades were poisoning the way we think about issues. Despite the fact that women had long since had equal legal rights by this point, the 90s was the decade of girl power and the early wave of mainstream empowerment rhetoric. This became known as the third wave of feminism. The racial wing of social justice had been poisoning institutions for a long time at this point, to the point that people had become afraid of noticing things, not to the point that officers of the law would allow children to be abused for fear of being called racist, or even punished for doing what should be their duty. Underground, unseen by the vast majority of people, something only rumoured at by Nazis like the BNP, a vast abuse ring was building in Rotherham, Yorkshire. From 1997 up to 2013, a great number of young girls, later reported to be over a thousand, were abused by Middle Eastern gangs, euphemistically referred to as Asians in the British media, and when parents went to the police, they were ignored or mocked. One man who took the law into his own hands was arrested, and the police claimed his underage daughter was engaging in consensual activity. Officials that spoke out were sent to diversity training, and the situation grew worse as the institutions that were meant to protect people grew more and more poisonous. The assumptions of victim-oriented ideology led to a misguided construction of a multicultural society in which demanding equal responsibilities of minorities to go along with equal rights was considered a racist sentiment. These attitudes led us into a crazy new millennium, where in the second decade, intersectional social justice would gain a complete stranglehold on the left. <laughs>